All right, so we'll be continuing in the pursuit. We've been chasing after a few things the last several weeks. Righteousness, life, grace, love, faith, kind of based in part on this passage from 2 Timothy of fleeing, getting away from sinful things, but rather pursue, chase after, uh, long for righteousness, faith, love, and peace. We've covered righteousness, faith, and love, and we'll kind of review faith a little bit. If only there was a fourth category that we could cover today. Maybe we'll look at peace. Um, along with those who call on the Lord from be pure. I really like the second part of that verse because, yeah, Paul is in his, um, really, his, his passionate message to Timothy is saying, okay, stay away from these things, pursue these four specific things. Those are like the key things in the, in the Christian life. But that last part says to me, you don't do it alone along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So associate with those that are going to help you move in the right direction. I think we underestimate the importance and the power of people and of friends. In fact, studies show that <clears throat> when they do surveys that most men, many men, will go their entire lives without having what they would consider a best friend. Um, now, maybe those surveys are not accurate because men are probably not going to answer those surveys. Um, men may have a unique communication mode. It's called, I'm not going to answer, but we need people and we need the right people. Um, there's the old expression, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. So if you hang around with idiots, then your future is probably going to be filled with idiotic things. So instead, with pursue people that are pursuing the same thing. That's a good litmus test for a potential friend. Like if you want to interview me to be your BFF or your BPF, your best pastor forever. What? <laughs> I don't know. It sounds like a medical condition. Yeah, it's like one of those horrible drug commercials you see on TV. It's like, have you been suffering from BPF? Um, but, you know, just look at these individuals that you hang out with. Are these folks pursuing righteousness? Are they trying to do the right thing? Doesn't mean they're perfect. What does their spiritual walk look like? Are they loving individuals unconditionally? And peace, which we'll get into today. We also mentioned the passage from Galatians, how a little bit of leaven in verse 9. I love the passion that Paul has, and it's a very personal Paul that we see at the beginning here when he's talking to the churches in this region of Galatia, saying, you were doing great. <laughs> you were running well. What got in the way? Who hindered you from obeying the truth? You bought a lie. What was the lie that you bought? Did you buy the lie that you're not worthy? Did you buy the lie that you're inadequate? Did you buy the lie that your past is going to keep you from a good future? Did you buy the lie that God can't forgive me of the things that I've done? Paul continues that this persuasion is not from him who calls you. So who's the one who calls us? God. So it's not from him. He's not going to say, he's never going to say that you're unworthy. Th that would be an insult to his own character, but it would be an insult to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Christ's death gave us worth. He gave us all the worth that we need. This persuasion is not from him who calls you a little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. So we took a look at leaven. It was communion last week. Uh, that's why we use matzah. Now, I've been to churches where they use, you know, they rip off a piece from French bread or whatever and don't see anything, uh, don't think anything of it. I'm not saying that's the cardinal sin, but you're, you're missing the importance of the ritual because leaven represents what in Scripture? Sin. And Christ, who knew no sin, became sin for us, right? So the matzah represents his broken body. And so if it's a loaf of French bread, 
and Jesus wasn't French. There's no leaven in it because he was without sin. It only takes a little bit. That's where you were introduced. I just thought he was so cute, I had to, oh, you've got, Marcy has it. Are you gonna let it go? Oh, I should have put a picture up here. When those things, talk about transformation, Look, if I can make a spiritual object lesson out of plush toast. Anyway, when they came, it came, they came vacuum packed. In fact, the one guy, because they were vacuumed, I took pictures of it, so I, I, it's on my phone, but um, it's hilarious to me. And the poor, the one guy, his, half of his smile was like, Bleh. So he had some issues, and I thought, are these things going to fluff up? But I put them in the toaster, and they did fantastically well. Well, the other guy didn't so much, but. You got the sad toast? She wanted the sad toast? Do you want sadness in your life? No, I just think he's cute. There's nothing cuter than a toast suffering from depression, apparently. Pardon? He just needs some butter. Butter and Jesus. You know, those that will solve just about any ill that we... Oh, stop, Brian. The talent show's over, remember? <laughs> Small compromises lead to big compromises, and big compromises can lead to disaster. Reference James 1. Spurgeon put, it this, Spurgeon put it this way, Christian, beware of thinking lightly of sin. Take heed in case you fall little by little. The big falls are always a result of compromise, of small compromises. You might see it in your own personal life. We're also seeing it as a nation where we've compromised. Even, I think, the church, Christianity, Christians have, in some cases, said, well, you know what, let's just let them have that battle. It's just not worth fighting. Well, 10, 20 years later, we've got men beating women in a swimming pool. And your homophobic, transphobic, whatever-phobic, aquaphobic, um, if you state the truth, and they call him a, a, that he's, you know, transitioned or transitioning. But, you know, uh, anyway, let's not get into all that. Let's get out of the pool. Speaking of P, peace is our sixth one that we're going to add. Now, when I saw this picture, what does it look like to you at first glance? It looks like sprinkles, which I was really excited because I love sprinkles. Uh, they're actually people. Um, Forming the peace sign. Now, how many of you have heard, because I heard it growing up, that the peace symbol was an upside-down cross that had been broken? How many of you have heard that? Okay, not as many as I thought. Um, that's actually not true. Uh, it was invented, created in the 50s by a British uh, individual. His name was Gerald Holtham, and it was for the British Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. This was in 1958. Um, and he said that it, it represented despair. Does anyone know where the symbol comes from? He, he borrowed two existing symbols, if you will. Yeah, Brian? It's not. That's a really excellent guess. And yeah, they did use, you know, Churchill's famous for the, actually it was this way, the victory sign, and then it got turned around for uh, peace. It's actually from semaphores, from the semaphore flags. Many of you were par participated in, Mike, you were part of the semaphore club in high school. Boy Scouts, did you learn about semaphores? And so I didn't know this, so you know, you learn something new every once in a while. So we have uh, the N, so the arms like that, that's the bottom part. And the D, straight up line. And so those two symbols were superimposed to make the peace symbol. Why the N and why the D? The N is for nuclear and the D is for disarmament. 
Oh, I know, right? I didn't know that either. So uh, the artist that did this said that the, it represented despair with the central lines forming a human with his hands questioning at its sides against the backdrop of a white earth. Now from the gentleman, Mr. Oops, I forgot his name already, Holton, he said, referencing this illustration, he said, I was in despair, deep despair. I drew myself the representative of an individual in, desper in despair with hands palm outstretched outwards and downwards in the manner of Goya's peasant before the firing squad. Who hasn't thought of Goya's peasant before the firing squad before? I formalized the drawing into a line and put a circle around it. There's Goya. Uh, Goya was a Spanish artist, uh, if you didn't know who he was, and um, he enjoyed sitting there and looking unhappy. There's the painting in, in question, and a peasant before the firing squad, and you can see his arms are up, but that's what apparently inspired uh, the artist. So that's where the symbol comes from. But you know what, the Bible gives us a much better definition of what peace really is. Now, I'm not gonna steal Morgan's thunder, but on April 3rd, Sunday evening, he'll be covering peace, because it's the third of the fruit of the spirit. So, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. None of us have a problem with any of those. Amen. Um, and so peace from a biblical standpoint is a very different thing. Now we've talked about peace recently. We, um, well, I'll reference that in just a moment. There's the word in the Greek. It's irene, and irene means the primary definition, definition is a state of national tranquility. All right, well, we can grasp that. Paul's usage, though, is that second definition there. It's peace between individuals. So when you look at the fruit of the Spirit, what does that tell us? This has a lot to do with our relationship with one another, with fellow believers, just humanity in general. The fruit of the Spirit is, you know, how are we relating with other people? Are we showing them love? Do they see the joy of Christ in us? I mean, the joy of Christ, it's one of the most powerful testimonies that we have. And if people look at you and don't see the joy of Christ, it doesn't mean you need to jump up and down and smile and be goofy. That's not what I... But they should see there's something different about you. You know, if you're happy and you know it, tell your face. Peace, patience. Do your kids see patience in you? <laughs> your parents see patience in you. Yeah. Anyway... Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's a daunting list. Anyone feel any conviction about any of those? Does anyone want to be transparent enough and, and pick one or two that you struggle with the most? Yeah, Marcy? Patience? Did somebody say all of them? Tony? Let's just have a time of prayer for Kathy right now. <laughs> anyone else? Yeah, Julie. Oh, you got very, she got specific. Kindness towards my siblings. No, that's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, as awesome as Lydia is, and Emmanuel, and Alex, who's the most problematic? Who do you have the most problem with? The biggest problem. Does Alex know? Okay, well, because you've let him know. He's witnessed some rotten fruit. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Uh, peace, and joy. peace and joy. And isn't it interesting when if you're if you're lacking in one, it has an imp how how do you have joy if you don't have peace? Where is your source of these things? You know. Um, anyway, now let's cover the works of the flesh and see how many of you struggle with those. No, we're not going to do that because I'd like there to be peace in here. But look at 20, verse 24. We know, look, we, we know the fruit of the Spirit. We've heard it a thousand times. You may have memorized the list. Against such things there is no law. So there's no prohibition. In fact, to the contrary, there's an encouragement, an exhortation, a command to produce these things. 
But verse 24, we often, I think, we leave it out. And, wait, if there's an and, that means we need to keep reading. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It means that this list is not impossible. It means that with the death of Christ, we can do these things. We can produce these things. Not only can, but we're commanded. It's not impossible. It's difficult, and some of you shared the ones that you struggle with, um, the fruit of the Spirit. We could add more. Paul's list is not exhaustive by any means. It is interesting that on the works of the flesh, he lists a bunch, and at the end he says, and things like this. He doesn't do that with this list. And I think one reason is because, um, can somebody think of, 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 of fruit that's not on this list? We should be able to come up with a few. I'm sorry, I believe that there was something very interesting going on here. Did you have one? Olivia said strawberry. <laughs> strawberry. I didn't say that. <laughs> Maybe truthfulness, but honestly. Yeah. Truthfulness. Yeah, why isn't truth up there? That's a great one. Any ideas why it's not up there? Was Paul forgetful that day? Forgetfulness? Is that one of the fruit of the Spirit? <laughs> when your fruit gets older, it's, yeah. Why is it not up there? It's a great one. We know we're commanded to tell the truth. I would argue that it is up there. If I love you, what am I going to do? I'm going to tell the truth. Think of all of the Ten Commandments. They're all about, the first four about loving who? God. The final six or in sign language, are about loving others. So if I love Mike, I'm not going to murder him. I love you, Mike. <laughs> He's very happy. Yeah, Carlene. But sometimes uh, telling the truth can be an unloving thing because you don't want to do Yes. No, yeah, you make a very good point. So it's, it's, it's truth combined with compassion and kindness. You know, so, yeah, we are to be truthful. You know, does this dress make me look fat? Yeah. <laughs> Never answer that question unless I'm the one asking it. <laughs> then we have, <laughs> then these fruit are not the main problem. We have other issues. I haven't worn a dress in years, so... I can't say anything because I think Pitch, yeah, there you go. Pitchford's have video. That was 91, 92. It was a talent show, actually. I was uh, mentioning that to Teresa, and I was praying that there was no video evidence of that. Oh, several hands are going up. How much money do I have in my bag this morning? Will, bribery, is that one of the fruit of the Spirit? So, yeah, we could list a lot of other qualities that we're commanded to have, and you might not find them on this list, but again, I would argue they are on that list because you cannot, um, you know, think of grace and mercy. I mean, some of them are very similar to the words that are up there, but they all tie in with each other. That's why it's important that we look at, at all of them. There, now, I'm getting into a study on this passage, and I didn't mean to get parked there, but there, there, there is a very specific reason why it doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. It says the fruit. It's singular in the Greek and in the English because it's talking about this is what we should be doing as believers, as Christians. You should see these things. It's part of what we produce. But the fruit is, uh, it's, it's the fruit of what? The Spirit. It's what he, the Holy Spirit does in us as he indwells us and as we are filled with the Spirit. Because if we're not filled with the Spirit, we don't produce this. We can produce faux fruit. Did you have a, a, a grandmother, a relative that had wax fruit or glass fruit? Have you, have you, rubber, have you seen the I Love Lucy episode when she's really, really hungry at Ricky's boss's house and she doesn't know it's wax fruit and like an apple gets stuck in her teeth um, when it was actually made out of wax? So we can produce faux fruit 
it looks good, but it's not real. And God knows that it's not real. All right, that same word shows up in Luke 2.14. That passage should be familiar. We just covered it during Advent, during the Christmas season. There it is, but a slightly different definition. This is actually the fourth definition in the list. Um, the Messiah's peace, the way that leads to peace, eternal peace. In other words, salvation. So when we look at that, glory to God in the highest and on earth, salvation, the gospel, among those whom he is pleased. Who is he pleased in or with? Those who put their faith and trust in him as the Messiah. So as we continue with peace. We're going to go to Romans 12. We won't get done with this today, I'm guessing, because Romans, <laughs> Romans is a fantastic book. It's an amazing book. It's a challenging book. Um, it's probably the most applicational book in all of Scripture. And Paul does what Paul does best in that he lays out an argument. And chapter 12, verse 1, is a transition verse. Because for the first 11 chapters, Paul has been laying out his argument from the very beginning. One of the first verses we see is he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. So he wants people to know. And then he launches into people who apparently are ashamed of the gospel because they're not living their lives according to what God would want them to do. The Cambridge Bible for Schools and Colleges says about these first 11 chapters, in view of the whole previous argument in which gratuitous remission of sin and acceptance of the guilty for Christ's sake has been explained and the consequent gift and influences of the Holy Spirit and the assurance of glory in which too the closing sections have reminded both Gentile and Jewish believers of the special aspects of sovereign mercy in their respective cases. All right, that's a little wordy, um, but the authors point out that those first 11 chapters lay out really key doctrines, teachings in Scripture. I mean, think about, in fact, let me just go to Romans, and I'm going to, this is in the ESV, so we're going to base it on their, their chapter headings. So remember, the chapter headings are not... Those are not from the Holy Spirit. Hopefully they're in, inspired in the sense that the men and women that put them together um, are using their brains, their God-given intellect. Uh, so I'm just going to read chapter headings 1 through 11. Now, greeting, I think we can figure out that. No great doctrinal uh, discourse there. Longing to go to Rome. But here's our first really important one. The righteous shall live by faith. And what does Paul do? He quotes a conversation between God Almighty and Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, if you prefer. Either one will clear out your sinuses. So he quotes that conversation. God's wrath on unrighteousness. Chapter 2, God's righteous judgment. God's judgment and the law. Chapter 3, God's righteousness upheld. No one is righteous. The righteousness of God through faith. Chapter 4, Abraham justified by faith. Do you see Paul's argument? Do you see how he's building on this? The promise realized through faith. Chapter 5, peace with God through faith. Death in Adam, life in Christ. Dead to sin, alive to God. Slaves to righteousness. Chapter 7, released from the law. The law and sin. Chapter 8, life in the spirit, heirs with Christ, future glory, God's everlasting love. Chapter 9, God's sovereign choice, Israel's unbelief, the nation, not, not the awesome guy. Uh, chapter 10 actually is a continuation of chapter 9, so there's no title heading at the very beginning, but verse 5, the message of salvation to all. Chapter 11, the remnant of Israel, Gentiles grafted in, the mystery of Israel's salvation, and now chapter 12, a living sacrifice. So Paul gives all of this, he lays all of this groundwork, and 
says, therefore. <laughs> so read Romans 1 through 11 if you want to know exactly what therefore is therefore. <laughs> I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. We're not even going to go past that for the moment because there's so much in here. And I apologize. We're going to go through Romans at some point because we just, how can we not? It's just such a fascinating book and such a vital. I mean, all scriptures God breathed, profitable for instruction and righteousness, so we know that. There's not a word, there's not a punctuation mark that isn't important. So how do we, how do you prioritize what you read? Well, just read it all. Um, but, but Romans is such a, a pivotal passage in scripture because it is so practical and applicational. We can learn, you want to know how to live as a Christian in this crazy world? How about listening to a guy who was living as a Christian in a crazy world. We think our world is evil and nasty. I would argue that his world was more evil and nastier. Now, we're catching up, but what you think about it, we're not even close. As bad as things are, there's a whole lot more bad out there. And the more that the church shrinks and shies away from preaching the gospel and teaching God's word, the worse it's going to get. Because the world isn't getting worse because of evil people. The world is getting worse because of good people not doing what they're supposed to be doing. The church not fulfilling its responsibility. Making compromises. Well, you do your thing, I'll do my thing. Their thing could kill you. So why wouldn't you step in? Do you care about your neighbor? Do you care about your coworker, your non-Christian relatives? I believe you guys do or you wouldn't be here. But are you passionate for the gospel? As Paul said, again, from Romans 1, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, but he didn't sit on his backside and just complain about it. This isn't Paul's Facebook post ranting about the latest stupidity that we see in the news. I don't have a problem with us ranting about it, but then what are you going to do about it? I mean, I stood here earlier, I wrote a devotional on Friday about it, if you got the devotional, about my just being perplexed and angry about the whole Will slash Leah Thomas, you know, thing. But I haven't done anything about it. I did pray about it. I prayed for Leah Thomas. I want him to come to Christ. I, if he doesn't know Christ, I think he's confused. I think he's got some delusions. He's either delusional or he's just evil. You know, so he either really thinks he's a woman trapped in a man's body, which means he has some issues. Now, I don't say that in a mean way. I say that in a very loving way. He needs help. And if he's just, this is all fraudulent, and he realized, hey, you know what? I could start winning. I could start getting some medals and some attention by, you know, he ranked, in some races, he ranked like 642nd in all of college stuff when he was racing as a man in Penn State then all of a sudden, he's breaking records. And if you know anything about swimming, swimming is a sport of not seconds, but <laughs> milliseconds. And he's winning these races. There are even many people feel that he's holding back. And uh, he, in fact, he lost a race, or he didn't come in uh, first on one of them. I would agree with many others that said that he, uh, there was a first place winner in that last race, but it was the female that came in Second, um, she's the legitimate winner. But what a horrible thing to do to women's sports. I mean, it's just unbelievable. But what are you going to do about it? So great, post on Facebook, and then what? <laughs> what are you going to do about it? Have any of us, I'm not asking for you to show hands, but have any of you written your congressman, your congresswoman? Have any of you talked to you know, representatives in government? Have you written President Biden? And you may think, well, they don't listen. Actually, they, they do. They'll, at the very least, they keep counts. And they, look, they care about the polls. They care about what the people think. And if enough of people stand up, then it might make an impact. But remember, who is the impact? Who's responsible for the impact of you doing the right thing? God is. We're responsible to do the right thing. Let God worry about the consequences. 
Sheesh, I've got a sermon within a sermon. How many were we up to today? That's about five or six. Get out the toast again. Let's do that. So Paul, interestingly, first off, he does, this is not in the imperative. This is not a command. I appeal to you, therefore. Now, Paul doesn't shy away from commands, right? He has no problem saying, do this, don't do that. Why doesn't Paul do that here? He could. He could have said, I command you, therefore, on behalf of Lord God Almighty, that you present yourselves as a living sacrifice. Why do you think maybe there's no command? Thoughts? Yeah, Marty? Yeah, it's, we have a free will. We have a volition. And so um, I think Paul is very intentional in saying, you have to make the decision. It reminds me of Paul's letter to Philemon. We just talked about this not long ago, but remember Philemon, he's a church leader and has a slave, Onesimus, that runs away to Rome. And Paul, who's in jail, writes a letter to Philemon. And several times you see Paul say, I could tell you to do this. In other words, I could make you do it because I'm an apostle. I have the authority. I could do it. But I'm appealing to you because I know you're going to do the right thing. Did your parents ever give you that one? It's like, I'm not going to tell you what to do. <laughs> when I heard that, it's like, sweet. <laughs> I'm off the hook. <laughs> Don't listen to me on anything to do with, yeah. So Paul is saying, I could command you, I have the authority to do it, but you know what? I trust you're going to make the right decision. You're going to do what's right. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. In the Greek, ladies, in case, in case you want to see this as a loophole, it's brothers and sisters. It's a gender neutral. Sorry. Ah, yeah, you got to obey God again. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters. So Paul's audience is who? Christians, non-Christians, mixed? It's Christians. In fact, pretty much Romans is for the believer, for the Christian. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters in Christ. That's my addition. By the mercies of God. So Paul says, I'm not going to command you because I trust you're going to do the right thing. But here's my authority. I appeal to you based on the mercies of God. Oh, man. Guilt trip. What has more power than God's mercy? By the mercies of God to what? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. There's so much in that one verse. The word in the Greek for present is the same word we see used in the Levitical code as far as presenting ha animal sacrifices. It's the same, now realize this is Greek, but it's the same idea as in the Old Testament in the Hebrew that you are to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. In fact, you can reference... Uh, Luke 2.22, that's the passage where Mary and Joseph, eight days after Jesus' birth, um, he's circumcised, and then he's presented in the temple. Same word. What is Jesus presented as? A sacrifice for us. The baby born to die. And so he's presented as a sacrifice to the Father, to the Father's glory. So it's the same word that you would find there. You can also find it in Colossians 1.22, which has a similar meaning, again, of, of Christ sacrificing um, his life for us. <clears throat> I don't know that we'll spend a lot of time there, but if you, if you, you want to read on your own a little bit more, this, this whole phrase of 
presenting your bodies. And Paul's bodies can be literal, uh, but he's, he's including, it's a very general term there, your physical body, all aspects of your body, the whole person, body, mind, soul, all of us. So present your entire being as a living sacrifice. Romans 6, um, we're not going to go through it, but there's several uh, passages in there that can give you a little bit more information as to where Paul's coming from, because everything in chapter 12 is based on what he's already laid out in the first 11 chapters. Chapter 6, you might remember some of these verses. Verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? The ESV says, by no means. I think it's a little weak. Um, it's literally God forbid. Because if God forbid something, is there any chance of it happening? No. <laughs> so that's the strength of that phrase. It shouldn't happen. How can we who died to sin live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's what being a living sacrifice is. It's recognizing that we can live because Christ died. Without that, we're spiritually dead. And we can't live a spiritual life. And it continues on. It's, it's, a, it's a great passage. Paul kind of has a similar phraseology in verse 15 as he does in the beginning of verse 1. What then are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means, God forbid. Uh, and, and it continues on. Like I said, we could read the whole chapter, but we're not going to do that. So this idea of living sacrifices. Now, Paul's audience certainly knew what animal sacrifice was about because it had been practiced for generations. And yet he's telling them to do something a little bit different. He's saying it's no longer an animal. Now, why is there no longer a sacrifice of an animal? Well, because the sacrifice had been taken care of. The Lamb of God took away the sins of the world. So the ultimate sacrifice happened when Jesus is murdered and crucified on a cross. So now he's, Paul is saying, you're to be living sacrifices. There's a wee bit of a challenge, though, with living sacrifices. What can they do that the other sacrifices couldn't do? Crawl off the altar. And we do it all the time. <laughs> when we sin, we crawl off the altar. We're no longer sacrificing. We're no longer surrendering ourselves to the will of God. We're no longer allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us. So we get wax fruit. Living sacrifice. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Um, let's take a look at the, that last part, because we'll take a look at some other translations as well, because um, the word for spiritual there, sometimes you can see translated as rational or reasonable. Uh, the word in the Greek, 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 I don't know what language that is. Things from Guardians of the Galaxy, but the word in the Greek here um, for rational or reasonable is logikos. Logikos, um, you can see the primary definition is rational, agreeable to reason, following reason, reasonable. And if you translated the word that way, that's fine. So it's your reasonable act of service or your reasonable worship. Is it reasonable and logical for God to ask you to do stuff? <laughs> yeah, it is, because we belong to him. He created us, he knows what's best for us, and he has every right to tell us what to do. The, Paul's usage is similar, but a little bit different. The worship which is rendered by the reason or soul, spiritual. So if you read it that way, well, ESV actually does a really good job. Spiritual worship is, is a good way to translate it. Um, let's just, for comparison's sake, there it is in the ESV on the top, your spiritual worship. Uh, NASB, similar, they throw in the word service.
service, so which is your spiritual service of worship. So in my opinion, I'd say those two are the best uh, translations. King James and New King James are identical. They translate it reasonable service. And NIV uh, translates the, the whole line a little bit differently. This is your true and proper worship. They're all fine. Um, you know, there's minor differences there. The ESV and the New King James, the reason I put the asterisk there is that they both, if you look at their footnotes, they'll put down that it can also be translated, this is your rational service. Um, so that's, I think, important to keep in mind. To give you an idea of what Paul is talking about, let's take a look at Peter, because Peter uses the same word. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. I like how Peter echoes from the Psalms when he talks about tasting what the Lord, you know, that the Lord is good. Um, what's interesting about this word, logikos, is that it only appears in the New Testament, these two places. So in Romans and in 1 Peter. It doesn't show up anywhere else. So it's, that's one of the reasons I think it's been hard to translate, because when a word only pops up a couple of times, you, you don't necessarily get the context. But do you see how Peter's talking about it having to do with spiritual growth? If you want to get out of your spiritual diapers and stop spiritually loading your draws, then this is what we need to do. Peter says, put away this stuff, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. Get that out of your life. And he equates this or uses the example, the analogy of, of a baby, a newborn infant, just like they long for pure, well, just like newborn infants you could put it this way, they desire milk. Um, we should desire pure spiritual milk. Um, and because of that, then we can grow spiritually. If you're 30 years old and you're still on the bottle, and it doesn't say propel on the side, then maybe you have some problems you may be lacking some behavioral maturity. And it's the same thing with Christians. Now, I'm not gonna take a poll and find out where you're at, but we probably have some baby believers all the way up to very mature believers. And it's not based on your physical age, because you've probably met, you know, 70 year olds that are spiritually infants. And on the opposite side, maybe you've met somebody very young that is very mature spiritually. So what's, what makes the difference? What makes a spiritually mature in a word? It's God's word. It's, apply, it's application, isn't it? Reading it, studying it, meditating on it, great. What are you going to do with it? When God gives us commands, are we going to follow them? So it's I've used this analogy a thousand times, so 1,001. How about 10,000 reasons? Um, so it's like me having a gym membership, because I want to lose weight, um, get in shape, or whatever my, my motivation is, right? You know, Having a gym membership, but never going to the gym. You know, I have a membership, if you will, in God's family. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and yet if I don't do anything with it, then I'm going to be a weak believer. And when stuff happens, I'm not going to be able to carry the weight. I'm going to collapse. I'm going to be crushed. But we're not supposed to be crushed by the, the challenges of life because God gives us the strength. But we don't we can't tap into that unless we know his word and apply it. So I'll go a step further. I can, have, I can have a gym membership. I can actually go to the gym, but I stay in the parking lot. Still not going to help me out. 
I need to get up. See, there's, I got to put some feet to my faith. I believe that if I work out at Planet Fitness, that I will be ripped within just one day after never. So I can believe that the, the, the health benefits are going to be good. I can walk into the gym, I can even sit on the equipment, but what do I have to do for it to be of any benefit? I got to use it. Application. It does me no good. It does you no good to come to church every Sunday if you're not applying it. You might as well stay out in the parking lot. Well, I came to church. <laughs> Yay. But what are you going to do with it? You know, what are you going to do with what God has taught you? And it doesn't matter how old you are. Young, old, it doesn't matter. Use what you have. Be faithful in the little things. Because how can you expect how can you expect to do anything for God, really, if if you just if there's never any application? So, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that it by that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So, um, again, uh, same word in the Greek. Oddly enough, slightly different. Um, Interpretation there with Peter, but the milk which nourishes the soul. What is it that gives us spiritual, spiritual nourishment? All right, so with all that, let me read verse 1 again, and then we'll go into verse 2. <laughs> I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The word worship, probably it was in the 90s in the church, it kind of started taking on a different meaning. In some churches, if you say worship, it only means the music portion of the service. But that's, and that is part of worship, absolutely. But worship is also what else? What else is included in that? The preaching of the word. Hearing it, applying it, what else? The response. response. Somebody said prayer. Is that what you said, James? Yeah. So all of those spiritual disciplines are part of worship. Because what is worship? Worship is acknowledging who he is, who you're not, and then doing something about it. God says, I love you. You are complete in Christ. Go out there. What does God command us to do? Now, we think of the Great Commission. Oh, well, I need to become a missionary. Maybe. How many missionaries are in this room? Every single one of you. You just have different mission fields. So you may be called to go to another country. That would be awesome. You may be called to... I know you girls do this, but in, in your own school. You're missionaries in your school, in your neighborhood. Your family may be your mission field. And we can have more than one. It's your neighbor. It's your coworker. It's back to the, the parable of the, um, the Good Samaritan. Who is your neighbor? Well, in, in Jewish thinking, it was the guy that's standing next to me. That's my neighbor. But, you know, the guy that lives next door. I, and, and, and it was even more specific than that. It was the other Jewish dude that lived next door. If they were Gentiles, like, yeah, that's not my neighbor. So that whole story is told of the Good Samaritan to remind us that everybody's your neighbor. Even someone I've never met over in Ukraine. As we pray for Ukraine, as we pray for Russia, as we pray for China, as we pray for Taiwan. Any, look, <laughs> the world needs Jesus just as much as we need Jesus. And that's our mission field. So does it mean you get on a plane and travel thousands of miles to reach unreached people? It might. But our obedience isn't getting on a plane. It's doing what you're commanded to do with what God has given you. And there is no excuse that is acceptable to God. Because God says, if I've called you to do something, then I've completely, I've fully equipped you to do it. If you're a parent, 
that's your mission field. And you might feel like some days you are a failure as a parent. But God has put you in that place. And that means that you're not just adequate. It, it means you are complete. He's given you every tool. And you might think, well, I can't do it on my own. That's one of the wisest things you can acknowledge. So you need other people. You need people to encourage you, to support you, to chew you out if, if necessary. Like Carlene, you know, in telling the truth, you know, there's a time to tell the truth. We need to do it with compassion. Sometimes, again, does this dress make me look fat? Never answer that question. Um, if you were here last night, we showed a clip of Tim Hawkins singing about things you should never say to your wife. If you want to, well, not be murdered with a knife was one of the lines. But anyway, I don't know if that's from scripture or not, maybe from the message, but... Whatever struggle you're having, can you, can you give thanks to God for that struggle? Can you thank him and say, you know what? You put me in this position. I don't necessarily like it, but Lord, I'm here. I'm here for a reason. Every single one of you has value and worth. Not because an incredibly handsome pastor tells you that. Not because I tell you that. Uh, but because the God of the universe says that. Seriously, do you realize how much he loves you? That's how much he loves you. Who does that? You're not going to do that for someone you don't care about. You're not going to invest in someone that you think is hopeless. God does not think we're hopeless. If he thought we were hopeless, he'd just say, you know what, <laughs> game over. Let's, you know, reset. No, he wants us to be transformed. It's almost like, I don't know, verse 2 here. <laughs> We're supposed to, what, be living sacrifices. On the other side, we're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Does that mean God is calling us to be perfect? Actually, yes. Be holy, for I am holy. It's an impossible standard. But guess what? We serve an impossible God. And now there are some groups of Christianity that teach this sinless perfection, that, there's, that a human being, a Christian, is capable of being sinless at some point. I would strongly disagree. <laughs> I think we're living proof that we're still going to mess up. But if we have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if we are applying God's word to our lives, then we shouldn't screw up, certainly to the level that we used to. There should be growth because we're applying his word. We're doing what he has told us to do. So as we look at these six things, righteousness, life, grace, love, faith, peace, and no, I don't know how many more of these we're going to do. This is a great place to start. These are really amazing things that God has commanded us to pursue, to chase after, to invest in. We invest our time in a lot of silly pursuits. And you all know what maybe your silly pursuit is. <laughs> and you've probably been convicted of it a time or two. Um, but God has been, calling, has been calling us to these things. And if we're pursuing righteousness, life, grace, love, and faith, then we will have peace. Not perfection, not a life free from issues, free from challenges, but we can have peace, the peace that only God can give us. So let me ask you just a couple of questions here. How does presenting oneself as a living sacrifice bring peace? Peace in your own life or peace to others? We'll take just a couple of, uh, a few comments here, brief ones.
So how does presenting yourself as a living sacrifice bring peace? Yeah, James. Being obedient and in fellowship with the Holy Spirit brings peace internally. Did you say internally? I said be, being in, obedient and in fellowship with the Holy Spirit brings internal peace. Yeah, so we have eternal peace as we are being, as we're in fellowship, as we're being obedient. Um, when we have a future perspective, an eternal perspective, realizing that what we do here isn't just about now. Um, other thoughts? How does presenting oneself as a living sacrifice bring peace? Yeah, Regan? Yeah, I mean, do you guys, I mean, do you have friends or family members that, man, when you're stressing out and there's anxiety or you, you call them up because you know they can calm you down, they're not going to freak out. They're just going to be there, listen. Um, and we can have a huge impact by, you know, we're called to be ambassadors of Christ. And obviously a big part of that, the main part is proclaiming the gospel, the truth of the gospel. Another part of that is the peace that we can offer individuals, the wisdom, God's wisdom, not our own. I think it's witness. It also presents itself as witness. <coughs> Sorry, as far as being a witness, you said? Yeah, um, I think how does presenting oneself as a living sacrifice bring peace? It's, it's a witness. Yeah. It witnesses them. Because a lot of times you don't have an opportunity to speak to the person because of the circumstances you're not allowed at your job place to do it. And also, people are going to do what you say. You know, words come easy, but doing what you say you are speaks volumes because a lot of people, a lot of people are looking at you. I guess I'm not wrong. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, people. Look, with, with the mic, is much easier. It's not on the end. I think people are more going to value and make decisions on what they say, because you can say something, and if people don't see you back enough, they're not going to take you as being honest or authentic. So I think it brings peace, peace to other people. They say you're consistent in what you do, and if you have faults, they can see that. But you just go on and you say, I'm sorry. Because they're going to look at that, and you're told, Witness, it's just not the words, because you know. No, absolutely. I mean, yeah, words are nice, but words are cheap. So it's it's actions that that uh, back things up. All right. With that, uh, we're out of time. But uh, we'll go ahead and close in a word of prayer, and we'll sing one final song. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the peace that we have because of you. And Lord, we didn't get into this particular aspect of peace today, but peace starts by putting our faith and trust in your Savior. That's what he brought. He brought peace to humanity because there was a war between humanity and you, and there needed to be a mediator, and he is our mediator. Lord, thank you for the peace that we can have through you, the peace that your Holy Spirit offers us, that gives us, that we can stay focused on who you are and what you've done, for our, our, uh, done in our lives and what you will continue to do. Lord, thank you that you're always there for us to lean on, to cast our cares, our anxieties upon, and you're always there to give us wisdom, Help us to be smart enough to listen to it, to apply the truth of your word to our lives, and to proclaim the good news of the gospel with everyone we meet. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.